Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Now, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And when I say past, I am talking about 65,000 years of living in harmony and nurturing the land. We have much to learn about connection and respect for both land and country. Well, today we are going on a journey of discovery and it's so interesting to be talking to an experienced practitioner who reached his very high point in academic life and training and realised how little he actually knew and then pivoted and changed his direction for the next 30 years of his career. My guest today is Dr. Victor Martial Vega. Uh, now, Victor, in the past, has been chief of the head and neck cancer service and he's been focused on radio radiation oncology in Barnes Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. Missouri. He was also assistant clinical professor in radiation oncology at the University of Miami School of Medicine in Florida. Then he had an epiphany, and I won't spoil it for you, but now he is involved in integrative medical research and clinical practice. He's the medical director of the Martial Integrative Medical Medicine Center in Puerto Rico and professor at the uh, School of Medicine in Puerto Rico. Uh, now, Victor is a wealth of knowledge. I have the privilege of being on the editorial board of the Orthomolecular News Service with him, with him and uh, 50 or so others other world leaders around the world, and I'm really humbled to be in their presence. And I think my role is really to invite them onto my podcast and share them with you because they are truly remarkable people with some remarkable knowledge. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Dr. Victor Martial Vega. Welcome to the show, Victor. Thank you, Ron. It's been a pleasure. Oh, Victor, listen, I've been so looking forward to this conversation. Um, we are both on the board of the Orthomolecular News Service, uh, which I am humbled to be part of, but when I am associated with people of your qualification, you will understand why I'm so humble. But your background is in an oncology and specifically on radio ra radiation therapy in oncology, but about I can see from your CV, about 30 years ago, there was a pivot, there was a shift into a more integrative approach. I wondered if you might share with us what, what caused that change? Yeah, Ron, if you would have told me uh, 30 years ago that integrative approaches to medicine were the way to go, I would have laughed at you. However, I got really sick for two reasons. I wasn't eating well and I was stressing out. So this led to a major arthritis that nobody could find a reason for. When I went to see psychiatrists, I thought they were crazier than me, so I didn't see them. And I said, what am I going to do? And, and then I went to see a neuro-linguistic programming person, and she told me, you know, your problem is that you're stressed and not eating well. I mean, and I said, what do you mean stress? I did not even know what she meant. I, I didn't even know the meaning of stress. I didn't know its implications. I just didn't know what it meant. Until she started explaining to me, I started eating better, and the arthritis was gone after that. And the first thing that happened to me, I, sa I said, I got really angry. Angry because I was supposedly educated by some of the best institutions, academic and medical institutions, and they never mentioned to me nutrition or reduction of stress and well-being. And I realized uh, I have to make a major shift here. This has saved my life. I am here talking to you today because of that, because I made a change and I started exploring all these other things that give well-being and health. So, Victor, I just want to paint the picture here because 30 years ago, how much medical education did you have at that point? And how? And you were already a specialist at that point. How much medical education were, did you have at that point? How old were you then? If you don't mind me asking. At that, at that time, I was uh, 32 years old. 33 I, with arthritis. Yes, with major arthritis. Yes. Okay. Okay. And uh, 
I was only uh, managed with anti-inflammatories. There was really no cure, they told me. And I, I was a professor at the University of Miami School of Medicine. I had been a professor at Washington University in St. Louis previously. So I had been in the academic world. They showed me to do research in an academic setting and also to find out if something is working or not in my patients. So they, they taught me these things, but they never taught me about nutrition, exercise, detoxification from all the environmental pollutants and reduction of stress, nothing of that sort. And I found out later that that's the foundation for health. And that can improve or even reverse most major chronic diseases. I mean, that is just, it's almost like we should take a minute's silence just to digest the enormity of what you've just said, because it goes quite a long way to explain why we have the epidemic of preventable, keyword here, preventable, chronic degenerative diseases like cardiovascular disease, cancer, autoimmune conditions, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of, it's quite breathtaking. How, I mean, you obviously have reflected on this for many, many years. Yes. Well, <laughs> what you... Just to mention a few, cardiovascular disease, cancer, yep. and diabetes, arthritis, all these major illnesses. And they tell you, well, you have to do medication, you have to do cholesterol-lowering drugs, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery. But there's something that I uh, think you would appreciate is the President's Cancer Panel Report of 2010. President Obama commissioned the National Cancer Institute, the National Institutes of Health, and the Department of Health and Human Services. They're, they're conservative compared to what I'm seeing these days, but they are the authorities in the United States regarding health. And they wrote a report to him because he said, okay, guys, I want you to write a report telling me what's causing cancer in the United States. This is a major epidemic. And they say, Mr. President, was probably causing two-thirds or more of cancer. We don't know for sure how much because it hasn't been studied to the extent it should be studied. Are the environmental pollutants in the air from fossil fuels, in the food from pesticides, in the water from drainage of factories into the bodies of water of the world, and x-rays in hospitals? They said genetic causes of cancer account for approximately 5% or less. So this was a, an eye-opening for everybody. This should be in every major front page in the world. They said 5% may be cancer, like ataxia, telangiectaxia, seroderma pigmentosa, uh, multiple endocrine neoplasias. Yes, those are highly genetic, highly inher inherited from parents to children. But the majority are not due to genetic problems. That's what they put us in, in the head when we were in, in oncologic uh, academic centers. And it's just not true. It's the contaminants. And even these conservative agencies are saying that. So what I have found over the years is that when we start detoxifying patients of these things, proper nutrition, exercise, and stress reduction, we see tumors reducing, maybe disappearing, but then I started finding something I wasn't expecting. And this was more than 20 years ago. That my patients with cancer that had high blood pressure, diabetes, Alzheimer's, autism, cataracts, glaucoma, and many other things, hypothyroidism, will reverse these things with the same protocols I did geared towards the cancer, but will improve and even make those things go away and disappear. I do something that is called intravenous chelation therapy. It's an FDA-approved treatment to remove heavy metals like mercury, aluminum, and so forth. And when we use that, we see arteries that become unclogged again from the deposits of cholesterol that cause circulatory problems. They cause diabetes. They may cause Alzheimer's. You know, we, we tend to do specialties in medicine according to the system that's affected. But now I'm seeing it in a totally different light in the last 30 years because all these causes are common and depending on what the Achilles heel is from your predisposition, then that's what we will see. But the causes are actually the same in most of these chronic diseases. Hmm. 
I mean, that's so interesting. Um, two, two things that come to my mind here. Um, the, you know, you say the report done just, when was it, 2010? 2010. Yeah. And anybody Same. can find it in the internet. The yeah. President's Cancer Upon a Report uh, from 2010, you can find it. Uh, United States citizens can get the whole uh, book. It's almost a book. Uh, it's about 125 pages. And the first <laughs> recommendation of that panel was pollution is so rampant that the first recommendation we do for all Americans is that never go into your house with your shoes on. I mean, that's amazing. It, the implication is that the, the floor out there is so polluted that you may be increasing the chances of cancer and other illnesses in your family if you get in with your shoes on. The second wow. recommendation of the panel to the whole population, never drink water from plastic bottles. Those are carcinogens, and those are things that are not going to help your health. And the third recommendation, there are other recommendations, but these are the most important. The third one was when you're eating anything, make sure you don't have pesticides, hormones, contaminants of any kind. And I thought this was amazing that we've taken a major step, but it has to be publicized more. But even the conservative agencies are admitting this. So this is a very important uh, report. Well, that, that's what I mean. I mean, you know, we all know people who have got cancer. I mean, I had prostate cancer, right? And if I asked my doctor only a few years ago, or any of my friends who may have got colon cancer, have may have got skin cancer, may have got brain tumour, may have got kidney cancer, whatever they were given the diagnosis and they turned to their doctor in 2024 and asked them, Doc, why did I get this? I would say nine out of ten would get the answer, it's just bad luck, Ron, just genetics, it's just bad luck. So, you know, how long does it take for information to filter through to the coalface of medical practices? It, or, what, or perhaps perhaps the yeah. doctor would rather say that than, you know what, I don't know, I should go and find out. Thanks to people like yourself, the message is spreading and now it's reaching medical schools slowly. That's why I'm now a, a professor at a medical school in Puerto Rico to get that message to the students and they're understanding that. So little by little, they're getting to have that change. But, but, you know, the implications of what I just told you of that report are the following. I consider malpractice not doing one to three months of detoxification, nutrition, stress reduction, and exercise in all my cancer patients before they consider anything else. Because we have already proven, and there are several randomized studies that show that when you are prepared for if you decide to do chemotherapy and radiation, that's fine. If you prepare for these treatments, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, not only the side effects are reduced, but you heal much quicker from surgery, but also the results are much better. Now, during those three months, we might see tumors that start getting smaller or disappearing. So now at three months, the conversation changes. The narrative is different. Now, well, should I go with radiation, surgery? And I said, well, it depends on what you're willing to do for the rest of your life. If you keep doing this, it, it will continue working because we've already shown you that it's working. That's the importance of monitoring, following the patients. The treatment is not as important as the monitoring, follow-up, following them closely to see how they're doing. So hmm. now we are seeing that. And now the, the conversation changes, luckily, because we're dealing with the root cause of the illness. Mm, powerful. What a novel approach to medicine yes. to deal with the root cause of the problem. Wow, that's a whole new business model, Victor. Um, yes. I'm not sure how it fits in. But I know you feel passionate. You've already mentioned it, a, a few of the issues, and I want to dig down a little bit deeper into some of these things. You talked about nutrition, exercise, detoxification. I want to go into those things. Let's start with nutrition because there are so many confusing and often contradictory messages, high carb, low carb, gluten-free, you know, fat, low fat, high fat. What, what, what do, how, how do you, 
you know, make sense of that? And what kind of advice do you give to your patients? That, that, is, that is a great question. And it's amazing. Yes, there's so many contradictory things. One of the things I tell my patients is, listen, let, let's measure something that can be done, let's say, three, three times a day at your home and that you understand how to do it. So you can start learning how these things are affecting your body, nutrition, exercise, and so forth. So I use the pH of the saliva. The saliva should be alkaline at all times because it maintains the integrity of the calcium, of the bones of the teeth by being alkaline. Calcium and phosphate form calcium phosphate, and that goes into the mouth. If we have an acidic mouth, there's an implication to that. It means that the body is trying to balance to become alkaline in the blood. The blood should be slightly alkaline. A pH above 7 is 736, 7.36 to 7.44. So if you eat things, toxins, stress, lack of exercise, do things or, or, or do things or take things that rob you of that alkalinity, which is, by the way, electrons, we're a battery. So anything that takes away the energy of this body, this battery will cause harm then the body will try to find alkalinity to balance that. And the, one of the first places where it finds high alkalinity is in the mouth. So the mouth does not have that alkaline saliva for a while because it's trying, that alkalinity is trying to balance the blood. And we see them when foods are not good for the patient, three hours later, this becomes acid. So they show themselves, for example, very commonly in Puerto Rico, people are not fans of colored vegetables. It's rice and beans and meat. That's, that's the diet. Very little vegetable. So I said, do vegetables for a week or two. Be mainly vegetables and try it for yourself. If it doesn't work, then stop it. But do it for a week or two. Do the pH three times a day. And 90% of the time, the patient will say, oh, my God, not only is my saliva becoming more alkaline, but also I'm feeling better. And there's exceptions to the rule. Let me give you an example. Fruits are foods that have a lot of sugar. So people that are not exercising and do fruit may become acidic because they have that excess of sugar that then becomes other acids in the body. However, if, if I am doing exercise, which I do, for example, the fruit will make me alkaline because I need that fruit to burn the energy to do the exercise. So everything is relative. It's relative to what the patient is doing. It's, there's no such thing as, oh, this food is alkaline. This food is acidic. It depends on you, the patient, whoever is doing it and what their needs are, what they're doing with exercise, with stress, etc. So it's very interesting to do this monitoring with the pH uh, papers so they get to know themselves and understand how they can cheat a little bit here, but not a lot in something that will make them very acidic. Hmm. That is, I love that. I mean, the saliva testing is something that I've come in and out of in my own practice, but, and it's, I think it's important to explain to people that the pH scale where un seven, water is seven, neutral and below seven is acidic and above seven is alkali, but it's a log it's an exponential um, a gr a scale where 7.3 is quite, you know, is really alkali, you know, it's moving in that right direction. It's not just a little bit, it's significant. Correct. And 6.5 6 in a saliva. I mean, I once tested someone's saliva who came in with breast cancer, and when I asked her what she was eating, um, she said, no, I'm on a terrific diet. I'm on vegetarian, low fat, soy milk. I'm not uh, – no, no, it's brilliant. And I tested her saliva, and it was uh, 6.2. Or, or, you know, almost actually just below six, which was phenomenally acidic. And she was sitting there telling me how brilliant her, her diet was. How should someone test their saliva? I mean, you wouldn't do it straight after a meal. What's the protocol for testing saliva? The protocol is uh, that it has to be done before a meal because that's when you're uh, fasting for three or four hours. 
And it also corresponds that pH before a meal corresponds to the previous meal. So if before lunch your pH is acidic, the breakfast was not that good. And that's a general rule. There's an exception to that rule, and that is that if you have teeth infection, like a root canal or a chronic gingivitis, you might have acidity in the mouth that is due to that. So we take that into account as well. And as you know, it's very important to have a healthy mouth to be able to get optimal health. So we deal with dental health as well in our patients. Mm. Of course, we had uh, our co-board um, uh, member, Thomas Levy. I've had Dr. Thomas Levy on my podcast many times over the last few years. And most recently, we did one on oral health. So people can reference that. I think he's a wealth of knowledge. But but we're talking about nutrition and you've, you've put out there wonderfully a way for people to monitor how they're doing. But there's a lot more to it than that, isn't there? Yes. And uh, we can do uh, other things to measure. In my uh, practice, I see a lot of cancer patients to measure tumors, either mammograms, sonograms of the breast, PSA for the prostate. Those are the two most common cancers. So that's why I mentioned those. But also mm -hmm. CT scans, PET CT scans, MRIs. So those are ways to follow. In the cardiovascular situation, by the way, because I've seen so many of these things working for so many illnesses, uh, I ended up being a, almost an internal medicine doctor because I see all kinds of situations now. So in the cardiovascular sense, I do a carotid ultrasound that tells me what deposits of cholesterol may be present. And we follow that and make sure that that clears completely. And it can clear completely, even somebody that's 90% obstructed. The, the pH to explain a little more to people is basically telling us what is the concentration of hydrogen in the blood. That is mm -hmm. what it's measuring, the hydrogen concentration. And the higher it is, uh, more alkaline, that means more electrons, le less alkaline is acidic, it's less electrons. So indirectly, it's measuring this electronic state of the state of the other body. Hmm. I mean, uh, you know, it's so interesting to hear you focus on this because what I realize is that uh, we are a battery, we are a, we are this quantum um, being. And, and, and when we were studying biochemistry at school, uh, in, in medical or dental school, we studied what was called the electron transport chain as to how energy is produced in the body. We didn't, we didn't study the carbohydrate a transport chain. We didn't study the protein or the fat uh, transport chain. We studied how electrons were transported to produce energy. And that is just so central to health, really understanding how things go wrong and how to make them right, isn't it? It definitely is. That's one of the reasons why uh, intravenous vitamin C, which I use in a, in a lot of my cancer patients, works so well. It's an electron donor in addition to other things. It's an amazing antiviral. It will grab the toxins, literally speaking, instantaneously. So it's an antidote to a lot of these poisons that are electron robbers. So it, it besides being a vitamin, a prooxidant, it's also an electron donor, antiviral. So it's, a, it's an amazing tool. And you also said something there about the carotid and, and clearing out calcifications or cholesterol because the coronary calcium CT score is now thought of as being the gold standard in uh, establishing cardiovascular risk. The coronary calcium CT score, are you familiar with that test? Yes, that... I, I've used to use it uh, 15, 20 years ago, even 5, 10 years ago, but... I don't like it as much because the ultrasound is a quick way of doing things. You don't have to go right. through a CT scan, yep. maybe do a intravenous contrast. This is easier. And sometimes the calcium score will be normal, but I will be seeing the deposits in the carotids. They have, right. to, see, they have to see something really advanced to call it abnormal. So the calcium score hasn't helped me as much as a carotid ultrasound. Okay. And these calcifications or occlusions are reversible? 
It's a totally reversible process, yes. It's, uh, I've been using chela intravenous chelation therapy, EDTA is called ethylene diamino tetraacetic acid. EDTA is an FDA-approved tool for removal of heavy metals, but we've seen that it removes the calcium of the arteries. Dr. Lamas from Mount Sinai Hospital in uh, Florida did a randomized study through the National Institutes of Health with 2,000 patients, and they showed that this decreased mortality at 18% at five years. He said he never found something so powerful in any cardiovascular drug. And they're doing a second study now, mainly with uh, diabetic patients. So just tell me how, uh, I mean, I'm fascinated by that. How, how many treatments would one do or should one do to see results? We usually go on a weekly basis and we do a, a treatment a week for six weeks. And at the end of the six weeks, we take all the blood work because commonly the sugar will start going down in, in less than those six weeks. The cholesterol, the triglycerides, and we start adjusting the medications. As the blood pressure goes down, that's a signal that the plaque deposits are going away and the arteries are becoming more flexible again. So the high blood pressure starts going down. So once the, start, the blood pressure starts going down, we gradually decrease the, the amount of medication. Then we repeat the carotid duplex maybe three months after starting this. So we'll do treatments six at a time, reevaluation by a medical doctor, and then we determine how many they need. I have done intravenously maybe five to 600 procedures over the last 30 years. Now, I'm becoming wiser as to the, 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 the value of this. So I, I'm, I'm trying to do once to twice a week of these things. It, it also regenerates the body. There's a feeling of well-being. Everything starts working better. So I'm doing an experiment with myself now of doing it once or twice a week. Of the EDTA or the intravenous vitamin C? Intravenous vitamin C. And sometimes I put in the same IV, I will put EDTA. Right, right. Okay. Now, listen, we've cut, touched on a few things there, but I want to come back to nutrition and clear up some of the, you mentioned your Puerto Rican diet is very much uh, beans and rice and, and meat, uh, but, but what, what to you, you know, and we've said it's confusing, contradictory, low fat, high fat, yes meat, no meat, all this. What, what's your view of what, how we should be eating? I keep it as simple as possible for them. I say, for example, start increasing the amount of organic food in your diet because that food is supposed to be uh, devoid of uh, antibiotics, hormones, and pesticides. That's very important. Mm -hmm. And number two, I tell them to increase color vegetables like broccoli, spinach, cauliflower, asparagus, peppers, tomatoes, onions, you know. All the vegetables are colored, not the vegetables that are yams, like potatoes, sweet potato. Uh, I, I tell them no, because that's, that converts to sugar. Those are mainly carbohydrates. And of course, I tell them to monitor themselves with a pH to see which vegetable is the best for them and which one may not be as good as we thought it would be. But in general, I tell them more vegetables. Go with that to begin with. Keep it simple. Hmm. I also know that things have changed in terms of protein you know, we used to, it used to be advised that uh, something like 0.8 of a gram of protein per kilogram of weight, or I, I like to round it up to one, one gram of protein to one kilogram of weight, because my maths, I'd like to keep it really simple. Now I notice that many doctors who are focused on this are suggesting that we actually need more protein than that, 1.6 to 2 grams per kilogram of weight. And that in an environment where people are being told veganism is a great alternative. I mean, there's a contradiction there, isn't it? How do we reconcile our protein needs? That's a question I don't know the answer to in terms of a formula, but mm -hmm. I, I will have to follow the patients in terms of the uh, pH. And also there are other things that I follow. I follow the protein and amino acids in the blood. I follow mm -hmm. the anion gap, which tells me how's the alkalinity and acidity, whether eating more meat will make it more acid or not. So there's other things that I use to fine tune the whole situation. 
Because protein, it depends what type of protein. Because it's not the same eating from a cow that's been given organic, uh, genetically modified soy, genetically modified corn, uh, food that is riddled with pesticides, and that's what you're giving a cow versus a cow that is just grass-fed in a grass yeah. that's never been touched by pesticides. Those are two different animals, literally speaking. And you'll have more inflammatory omega-6 in the cows that don't eat well and more omega-3 anti-inflammatory in the ones that are grass-fed. It takes longer for that cow to develop muscle and weight, but it's healthier. So those are two different types of protein. The second thing is that you might benefit a lot by a vegan protein, which is vegetables that are organic. And some people may not do as well in, in the vegan arena. So that's another thing we have to pay attention to, because if I put someone in a lot of vegetables, they start losing weight. I don't want that. So I may let them cheat a bit with the carbohydrates versus someone that thrives in an all vegetable diet, starts gaining weight, muscle. So it depends on the person. You start monitoring other things. Also, we monitor the metabolism by measuring hormones. For example, thyroid hormone. There's an epidemic of hypothyroidism and people don't realize that you have to take different doses of thyroid hormone if you're taking it as a supplement suppress because it's suppressing your thyroid. And sometimes if you get sick, people that are taking this medicine may have to take three times the dose the days they're sick to get better quicker because the metabolism has to go up. Taking the same dose every day doesn't make any sense whatsoever from a metabolic point of view. And that will affect also how you metabolize all these proteins and things. So there are a lot of reasons and things that have to be paid attention to before I say, okay, this is the actual protein intake that will benefit you and what type of protein as well. Hmm. Now, you mentioned there, and I think it's worth repeating, that there's an epidemic of hypothyroidism. Is that what you Correct. were saying? Which, which is underactive thyroid. Yes. And a question I once asked a professor of medicine who was very big on the supplementation of iodine, which is apparently the biggest deficiency globally. Um, and that's what he said. Anyway, I said, if you had a choice of what you would supplement or add to the water supply, well, a lot of countries, including Australia, does, would you supplement with uh, fluoride or iodine? Because they both come from the same family and they have the potential to displace one another. So it's interesting to hear you say an epidemic in hypo underactive thyroid, which requires iodine, and water fluoridation, which is a, a pollutant. What do you th what do you think about that? I think that water fluoridation doesn't make any sense. We have to eat uh, as healthy as possible, and that will re will maintain the integrity of the teeth better than anything else. And fluoride, we know, is a neurotoxic, is a poison. We know that. And even the, the FDA already has uh, hearings in, in different uh, committees, and they're starting to admit that fluoride is not good. Now, the hypothyroidism that I see in Puerto Rico, most of it is due to the Epstein-Barr virus, the vir virus that causes mononucleosis. And that's my theory, because most of the time that they do a biopsy of this inflammation, they say, well, you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and it's inflamed with lymphocytes. And when we do the Epstein-Barr virus study with these patients, most of them are positive. So it's probably a viral illness. And when we do vitamin C as part of the management of these patients, we see that the hypothyroidism may totally reverse. So we're starting to confirm that hypothesis that probably that virus is as a cofactor, is contributing to that disease more than we uh, previously thought. And of course, hypothyroidism is something that doesn't make things better. So that has to be evaluated as well in the population. Mm -hmm. um, now, another area that I know you feel passionate about is exercise. And, I, and, I, and you, you had this wonderful um, short uh, YouTube clip on, on exercise that, that was related to a whole range of things. I wondered if, and, and people do find this whole thing about exercise a bit intimidating. Uh, 
What, what, tell us about exercise and what people should be doing or could be doing. Well, I, I started getting into the exercise arena when a, a, a lot of data that I saw in the last 15 years showed that exercise in most academic centers in the United States showed that exercise apparently has the potential of curing cancer. And I said, wait a minute, what's going on here? And uh, there's a study by Cianotto, Roswell Park Memorial Cancer Center, where they evaluated it prospectively. It's very hard to do a randomized study because it's almost unethical to exercising half of the patients, no exercising the other half, because we already know exercise is great. So what they did is evaluated them, the ones that were already doing exercise continue, the ones that were not, they evaluated the ones that started doing exercise after a diagnosis of cancer, in breast cancer. And they found that at 10 years, exercise, which the way that they defined it was moderate exercise, which is up to 300 minutes a week of exercise, moderate exercise. And in this case, is walking 45 minutes a day for four times a week. Those are your 300 minutes. They found that that is associated with at 10 years, these females with breast cancer had a lower chance of the tumor coming back. And 10 to 15 out of those 100 females were alive due to the exercise in addition to anything else they did compared to the ones that didn't. So this is a major discovery that 10 to 15% more out of 100 females could get cured from breast cancer and other illnesses as well. So it wasn't confined to breast cancer. It could also improve other illnesses, diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular, arthritis, or other things improved as well. But the chances of the tumor coming back decrease, sometimes even to a larger degree than chemotherapy or hormonal blockage. So that was uh, very exciting to see co being confirmed because most academic centers in the U.S. have also seen the same thing. It's just that it hasn't become as uh, prevalent in the official narrative of most uh, medical centers. Yes. The, um, and, and really, uh, walking, boy, you couldn't get a, a safer, uh, more social, more sustainable, cheaper uh, form of exercise. And if you're out there in the fresh air and the sunlight, uh, enjoying nature, it's a win, 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 win all around, isn't it? It's, it's great. I mean, it, it should be stressed that it should be the recreational physical activity type of, not, not just that you're doing chores at home and are exercising. Yeah, you might be exercising, but the one that they refer to is the one that is recreational. You don't have anything else in your mind. You're out there enjoying yourself. And they also discovered that the ones that do little to no physical activity did as poorly as the one that did too much exercise. So there's, there is such a thing as too much exercise. But of course, 350 minutes, maybe to the average American, is too much in terms of the cancer protective effects, but not to a, an Olympia or someone that is being used to doing triathlon. So we have to also make adjustments for the exceptions to the rule. Hmm. But that, but that for if you you know over exercising is just as bad as not exercising. But there's a very very big sweet spot in the middle there, isn't there? Yes, correct, and and that's amazing. And I I prescribe it to my patients in writing because I also find that if I just tell them, it goes in one ear out the other. But if I write it down, ninety five percent of the time they'll follow it. They say, oh my god, hmm. this is in a prescription. In, in, in a medical prescription, and they, they give it the importance it deserves when it's written. So I recommend all my colleagues to write it down. Now, you mentioned earlier on in our discussion about you've gone through 10, you were a professor of medicine, you've gone through God knows how much, how many years of study to get to that point, and you knew very little about nutrition or nothing, and, and also about stress. Stress is a big word, means a lot of things, a lot of different things to different people. What now does stress mean to you? It means uh, that someone that is going through stress, in one word, they're, they're miserable. They're either not sleeping well, not energized. They don't feel happy. They don't feel enthusiastic. You know, it's everything negative. Even if it's slight, it could be slight, it could be moderate, it could be severe, but it's basically 
feeling a lack of enthusiasm, mis misery, in other words. But stress means that the person is going and going and not giving themselves the time to be still and give to themselves what they need to recharge, feel good, sleep well. So most of us are not taught to pay attention to the signals that we're overdoing it. And I see a lot of that in my patients. Let me give you an example. They come to me often and they say, you gave me the stream and intravenous vitamin C has been three weeks and I feel worse. I said, I know what's going on. How did you feel up after the first stream? And I said, and they say, I feel great. I feel a lot of energy. How about the second one? I also feel better, but not as much. And I said, did you, after those first two treatments and now after the third, did you start doing a lot in your house? Oh, yeah, I painted the whole house. I went to my closet. I haven't been there in 10 years. I cleaned it out. I went to the mall and I bought some things I had to. I visited my children the other day. Then I did this. And I said, did you notice that the next day you were exhausted? You couldn't get out of bed? I said, yes, that's true. And I said, well. For the first time, you felt enthusiastic. You felt happy. And you said, the last thing I want to hear about is about doctors. I don't want to know about the condition I have. I want to enjoy life. And I said, that's great. But that's what happened. You became enthusiastic, and you don't know how to say stop. So you're learning to do that now. Next time I give you the IV, just keep most of the energy. Enjoy yourself, but not so much until you get used to paying attention to the signals that tell you you need to stop. You need to rest. You're recovering from decades of things that you were doing that were not the best for you. So it's going to take a while till you realize how to manage this energy content because I'm giving you energy. I'm depositing in like a savings account. But if you spend more than what I put in, what's going to happen? And if you have an infection, if you have anything, it could be something simple, a pain, you need to rest. There's nothing like resting. Rest until you heal. Some people have a, a, an illness. They take an antibiotic. And the other day, a patient of mine went playing golf. Then he called me. I'm worse. And I said, what did you do in the last 24 hours? Oh, I played golf. It was great. Two or three hours. And I said, that's what you did. Nobody that has a condition should be doing as much as they were doing before. Try to take it easy. And you will see how you get well. I had another patient that got very well and then she started going preparing the daughter's wedding and going out and feeling with energy and then she crashed and then i explained to them you know get used to feeling good which is great but save that energy that's precious energy you have to learn how to save it don't spend it all and you'll be doing great Mm, yes, yes. Amazing. Look, um, you also, uh, I know, like to use uh, lipids. I'm going to quote here, Victor, because, you, you know, this is the term. We were laughing about this before we came on. Uh, lipids, the use of lipids of high volatility and cellular penetration, which you very nicely in brackets put, uh, previously known as essential oils, and it reminded me of how naturopathy has been talking about leaky gut for about 40 or 50 years, but it wasn't until the, the term intestinal permeability was given to it that doctors started to sit up and listen to it as being something real. So I love for us to talk about lipids of high volatility and cellular penetration in the use of various ways. How do we use essential oils therapeutically? Uh, there, there are several ways. I use it very frequently in my practice to decrease the stress on my patients as they come in. Because as you inhale them, they go to the olfactory nerve, which is right here in between the eyes. And it's directly connected to the midbrain, hypothalamus, pons, medulla, and pituitary, thalamus. And it promotes decreasing the adrenaline of the body and increasing serotonin and dopamine. So in minutes, you can have somebody, for example, crying in a panic attack. And when they smell this, they become calm. They're actually starting to smile and laugh. So I have different formulations that I give them all when they come to my clinic. So they're ready to absorb all the things that I'm telling them, all the things I'm sharing with them. I also become calm so I can listen to them better. 
So inhalation is a very powerful tool. The second thing, I put them to inhale them sometimes with a diffuser throughout the night for two to four hours. Dr. Kathy Wu in South Korea, in her academic center, she did a randomized study with Alzheimer's patients. And half of them had placebo and half of them had this lipids of high volatility during the night. And they did an MRI, which is a scan of the brain, at the beginning of the study and six months later. And they found that the singular fasciculus, which is the connection between the temporal and frontal lobes, areas that are very important for memory, started regenerating. You could see it physically in the MRI. I, I mean, I've known this for many for a couple of decades because I've seen patients getting better with this situation, but it was shown in a randomized control study. And not only that, but they improved their cognitive capacity 275%. These are patients with Alzheimer's. So what that means is that if you previously remember only 10 objects that were given to you in a neurological examination, now you'll remember in 27. That's what this means. I mean, it's dramatic. I give it to almost all my patients. I do it daily because the brain takes a while to heal and regenerate. It's a slow process. But what people will notice is that every night there will be a, a dramatic and palpable change. You think it's coincidence, but then it starts happening every night that you do this, every single night. So it's very interesting that if it heals the brain, what other tissues in the body may heal? So these oils have the capacity also to heal. For example, I have a, a very uh, interesting blend that has uh, peppermint, rosemary, wintergreen, clary sage, clove, marjoram. And these are lipids that are analgesic, anti-inflammatory, and they will, will, to the extent that their body has not suffered for long, they will decrease inflammation and pain, but it does it in a matter of minutes when it works, which is very good. And number two, if it's done constantly and, and consistently, they will see healing of these areas, of these joints, of these uh, intervertebral like back areas that are hurting, the knee that is hurting, the neck very commonly, neck pain and discomfort, headaches. We see it very commonly. And the, the next thing I use it a lot for is for infections. They're antimicrobials, antiviral, antiparasite, antibacterial, and antifungal. I have a preparation that I developed during the pandemic that contains thyme, oregano, lavender, and other oils. And we send it to a lab and it showed that a spray of cells that were contaminated by COVID-19, spraying those cells, eliminated the virus in less than 10 minutes, 100%, just by spraying twice over the culture. But it did not kill one single cell. It was not toxic to the cells. And that's what we want. I can do a lot of chemical elimination of different viruses with things that are toxic but this is not toxic whatsoever. We also did a, a study in many patients' homes that were uh, contaminated by mold. Mold is different types of fungus that humidity promotes. And mold can cause all kinds of respiratory symptoms, so-called allergies, sinusitis, bronchitis, not feeling well, fogginess, fever, sore throat, a lot of the things that are attributed to other illnesses. And with one spraying of the area, and we did it scientifically. We bought the machines that the experts in mold eradication use to measure the mold in the air by cubic feet, how many units of mold in the air by cubic feet before and after treatment with a fogging device that will use this formulation to fog the area inside the house, and we compared it to the outside air. The outside air is the control. So typically, we see thousands of units per cubic foot in all the rooms of the house before we do this. In the outside air, it's usually from 100 to 200 uh, units of fungus or mold per cubic feet. And then after one spraying, it will become zero, undetectable. And then we mm -hmm. will 
promote diffusing devices that are quite inexpensive to diffuse the uh, lipids in the house because they also promote well-being, sleeping better. By the way, the side effects of the study I mentioned of South Korea were that it improved insomnia. All patients started uh, sleeping better. Number two, decreased stress. Number three, decreased anxiety. And number four, it decreased depression. And who doesn't want that? So promoting that in your house, it's not just the mold. It's also promoting all these good things. Right now, I'm impregnated with oils right now in this environment. I mean, I, I feel great. I know the difference if I run out of oils, but I never run out of oils. I have oils all over the, the house at this point. But but that, that's brilliant. I mean, and you're talking about this antimicrobial mixture of thyme, oregano, and lavender? Yes. And, and, and you also mentioned the other one that you that, that had um, peppermint, clove, rosemary, and what else? Uh, marjoram for the pain. Peppermint, uh, marjoram, rosemary, wintergreen, clove, lavender. And let yep. me know, and I'll send them to you so you can... Uh, also oh, experience I, I, them because that's nothing I, I, I like love it. this. I love, I, you know, one of the really big messages that I like to convey through my podcast is also, the, and our wellness program is that as the world we live in becomes increasingly more complicated, the solutions are actually remarkably simple, accessible, sustainable, cheap, and most importantly, effective. And uh -huh. this is a good example of that. I'm glad you said that because that's absolutely correct. And, and this is what I enjoy the most because when I'm sharing the oils, I get the benefit too. I start feeling better yeah. immediately. So it's almost like a laughter, laughing matter. I mean, we're laughing as to how they were feeling five, 10 minutes ago and how they're feeling now. That's one. Number two, yeah. the oils also dissolve plastic. So when you put them on, they get absorbed through the skin, through the inhalation, and it will dissolve plastics in your body and help them be eliminated. There are many studies that have been done on this. They remove petroleum-based products, which is plastic, gasoline, and others. And they may also remove heavy metals from the body. One of the most studied elements in natural medicine it's actually, everything is medicine. I don't like too much saying integrated medicine, orthomolecular yep. medicine, uh, complementary medicine. There's so many names, nutritional medicine, holistic medicine. It's all medicine. We just have different tools that we have to integrate to have really good physicians. And these things can remove that from the body. You have to make sure that they're high quality. How do you know they're high quality lipids of high volatility and tissue penetration? Because after inhaling them, you put them in your hands and inhale. After five minutes, your hand is dry. If it's still oily, that's a low quality oil or it has contaminants in there that are not being absorbed by the skin. Or other types of oil like coconut, almond, oils that will not get absorbed. These are not the oils I'm talking about. The ones that are the lipids of high volatility are high volatility and tissue penetration because they're terpenes, monoterpenes. Terpenes are one carbon atom and three hydrogens times two. So two groups of CH3, one carbon, three hydrogen, that come together and form a monoterpene. That's a monoterpene unit. And that's the unit that gets absorbed so well into the body. Number two, uh, the oil should have no expiration date. If you have an expiration date, that's a red flag. That's not a good, high-quality oil. It's taken me many years. I've been working with this for 29 years to find exactly the oils that I can use in my medical practice with no hesitation. They're safe and effective. Number three, you should be able to take the cap off, leave it in the closet for 10 years, and not have, have the same amount of oil, not, not evaporate. If it evaporates, that's a, a low-quality oil. You can put a drop or two in a plate. And if it evaporates overnight, that's not high quality. That's mixed with something else, another high penetration, high volatility lipid, such as gasoline. Gasoline also penetrates the body and, and it will leave your hands dry, but that's a poison for your body. So you have to be very careful with the quality. Now, how do I know that these oils have no expiration date? I mean, that's a bold statement. That's a bold claim. 
Yeah. And, and I'll prove it to you that, that it can happen. What is an, a very good example that thousands of years later, we have conservation of those oils in tissue? The mummies. The mummies were preserved by first doing a drying process of 45 days with salt, removing the internal organs, the brain, putting the body in salt, absorb all the water because water will rot anything, including the lipids of high volatility. So you want to have it dry. And then they would add lipids of high volatility and tissue penetration like frankincense, cedarwood, myrrh, lavender, and others. And those oils are still there 2,000 years later in those bodies. And it's intact. That's high quality oil. That's what I'm talking about. So when something has an expiration date, you know that that's not the one you want. You want one that will not have that expiration date, high quality, that will last. And I have bottles that I've had for 20 years, and they're even better than when I got them. Mm, wow. That's brilliant. I love that too. And you've talked about detoxification. You've talked about vitamin C, EDTA, avoiding chemicals, you know, like going, being very careful about the products you choose. And now you've added into this um, the essential oils. This is the detoxification process that you, is there anything else Correct. one would add to that? I also use pulse electromagnetic frequency and microcurrent. People say to me, oh, I know what that is. I use it. I use the TENS device. TENS, the transcutaneous unit that's used by orthopedists and chiropractors. That's not what I'm talking about. If you can feel the electricity moving your muscle, that's burning your muscle. I'm talking about my microcurrent is actually feeding the body electrons that are missing from the body. You don't feel the electricity, but you feel the benefit. You might feel during the session that your pain goes away, that you feel better mentally because we also do microcurrent in the brain area. You might feel less confusion or cloudiness and pulse electromagnetic fields. Those tend to take out as a, like in a magnet effect, toxins from inside of the cells. It, tools, it tends to pull them out. And it has been shown, too, that periodic usage of these two technologies can promote a stem cell formation of your own cells in your own body. We see frequently that a herniated disc in the lumbar area can come to its original position by doing this technology because the body do, does its own surgery. We don't need to put our hands in there. So I used to do uh, stem cells uh, 30 years ago. And as I discovered these technologies, I use stem cell injections less and less. I almost never do them. Now, the regeneration can also happen in the knee. Knee replacement is a very common situation because of cruciate ligament that is torn and we have seen in patients, even patients that are in a wheelchair ready for the knee replacement, that when they do these lipids, they do the program, the vitamin C, and they do the uh, pulse electromagnetic fields and microcurrent, that they may not need the surgery and they start walking again with no pain. And this might last two years, five years, seven years. It depends. You know, it depends on what they're willing to do to continue with this benefit. And patients tell me, yeah, you're telling me to detoxify, but then I'm going to get contaminated again. So what the heck? And I said, no, look at it like you're taking a shower. Would you take a shower every day or no? Because you're going to get dirty tomorrow again. And they say, oh, I understand what you're saying, doctor. If I don't take a shower for three days, that's, I'm going to stink. I'm not going to feel good. And I said, it's exactly the same with detoxification. It's better to do it than not doing it. It's going to benefit no matter how frequently you do it. Because it's just like cleaning. It's just like a, a, a general hygiene. When you take a shower, you don't do it for two or three days. Let me tell you, that's a big difference in your health. So the same thing can be extrapolated as a, a metaphor for the detoxification of the internal body. Uh, now, you've, you've introduced me, although I've heard about essential oils for many years. I now realize why the better, the different name there of high volatility and good quality cellular penetration. But this whole thing of microcurrent and pulse electromagnetic fields, how, give me a little bit. Let's take a step back here because it sounds, it, it is incredible. And bearing in mind 
that every, we are walking electricity, literally exactly. every every cell, every nerve, every biochemical reaction is actually the electrons moving one way or another. So this use of microcurrents that we can't feel or pulse electromagnetic fields that I presume we can't feel either, give us that 101. I mean, this is a new concept to me um, and probably to our listener. Microcurrent, for example, we were trained by Dr. Edward Kondrat. He's in Florida. He's an ophthalmologist. And he was doing a lot of microcurrent just by putting the, the towel here in the forehead and the back of the neck to get the retina to regenerate. And he was getting, with other things, intravenous vitamin C, intravenous ozone, nutrition, he was getting regeneration of the retina in people that were getting blind. And they were recovering the vision. And I said, oh, my God, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing this. And I said, could you come to Puerto Rico and train? I'll get you 25 physicians, and we'll do it here. So he came to Puerto Rico, and he trained us. The machine that he uses is the Inspire Star. Inspire, like inspiration. Inspire Star, one word. That's the machine we use. And I use it every day in several patients a day. I mean, it doesn't stop. I've done it in patients with cancer, which is the ultimate lowering of your energy. When you lower the energy from 70 millivolts, we get here in the plugs 120 volts. In some areas of Europe and maybe Australia, it's 220 volts in your, in your plugins. Mm -hmm. So the human body is a, is a fraction of that. It's 70 millivolts. That's a thousandth of a volt. We are extremely efficient machines with, with uh, millivolts, that's a thousand, 70 thousands of a volt. We're moving this body and we don't need to be plugged in all the time. That's amazing. So by giving electrons back to the body, when, when it's good. When we lose electrons and the cells go to 35 to 40 millivolts, automatically it turns into a cancer cell. So everything that we do to harm us, stress, lack of exercise, bad nutrition, and toxins, are, they're all doing the same thing. They're lowering the electrical activity of the body. And in most people, it's just a musculoskeletal disorder, a knee pain, a back pain, fogginess, irritation, depression, anxiety. By the way, depression and anxiety are mostly due to the same thing in most cases. And when you return... The electricity, we have shown by PET CT scans, tumors that have been managed with pulse electromagnetics and microcurrent only, nothing else. No intravenous vitamin C, no essential oils, just that. We've seen tumors almost completely disappearing by returning the electrical gradient. We're still in diapers. Let me, let me tell you, I mean, this doesn't work with everybody. It's like anything else in medicine, but... We're starting to see an amazing potential for these things. We've been doing this for 15 years. Now, the second one is pulse electromagnetics. The machine is the PEMF 100. That's the one I use. Pulse electromagnetic field, PEMF 100. Gary Gordon, uh, a well-known friend, a well-known physician, and a good friend of mine, he passed away a few years ago. He's the one who introduced me to that. And those are magnetics. And magnetics work the same way. When you put magnetism in your body and increase the magnetism, it will increase and transform the magnetism in your body. We have that capacity into electrons. So those electrons then are seen as food by the body and everything will improve from that cascade of wellness. So we use both. We use the pulse electromagnetics and microcurrent together. And we see uh, very, very promising and interesting results. Fantastic. Wow. Listen, um, this has just been amazing. I just wanted us to take a step back a little bit here because, you know, and I'm interested to hear your perspective on this. We have just gone through the global pandemic with all of its public health messages, all of its lockdowns, all of its vaccination, everything. I'm just interested to know what your reflections are on that, on that how it was managed, what lessons we've learned from it. When, when I first heard of the tools that were available for us, 
uh, it was December of 20, uh, 2020 when the, tra- the prevention treatment was available to be injected into everybody in the population. And I, I, they called me on a Saturday from the medical school. They say, listen, you can come on Monday to be injected. And I said, wonderful. Okay, send me the, the information. They sent me a concern form. And the concern form, he said, I have read this. I have read that. And I said, well, I haven't read it. So I, I went to get the report, which was Pfizer's report to the FDA with the results of four months. Great. So he said, 98% of the patients produce antibodies. I said, wonderful. That's what I want. I want antibodies. If this produces antibodies, I'm on. They said, however, the antibodies will, after three months, they, they start going down. So you might need to get another shot after three or six months, maybe every three months. And I said, uh-uh. I don't have the time to do that. I don't have the time to go every three months. Now, the other thing in the study that I didn't like was that, and this was before the general population got it. I was one of the ones in the front line because I was a professor at the medical school. And he said that everybody in the study was healthy and nobody died of COVID. And I said, wait a minute, if nobody died of COVID, how are they saying in the general narrative that it reduces mortality. There's no way they can determine it because nobody died of COVID in those studies. These are very healthy people. That was the fourth thing I saw. Well, if they gave it to mainly healthy people, how come they're offering it to older people, people that are frail, that are pregnant, that have other medical problems, and how are they knowing that that's good or not? And the last thing, I, I didn't like is that they started saying that you needed a refrigeration of minus 70 degrees. And I said, perfect. But then after two weeks, they started saying, no, you can put it in any uh, refrigerator. I said, no, that doesn't sound right to me. What happens, I think, was that the ref- those refrigerators cost sometimes five to $10,000. And, and a lot of people could not afford it. And they were not going to order the product. So they said, no, you use any refrigeration you can. <laughs> and I said, I got uh, vaccinated for hepatitis B in 1988. And I did my antibodies last year. And I still have antibodies. Now, that's the type of treatment I want. I want something that will last, not something I have to do every three months. So I immediately did not like those things. And I said, I don't think it's something I would recommend or consider. I recommend vitamin C. I recommend other things. And by the way, I got several patients that got sick, really sick, and they called me. I could not see them in person because they would come to the office and maybe just like the flu. I treat this like the flu. If you're having cough, fever, don't come to the office because you might have the flu, the, the, the cold, mycoplasma or something that could be given to other patients. So just say it all. And I will do something with several things that worked phenomenally. Vitamin C, 500 to 1,000 milligrams every hour. Steroids, like Decadron, 4 milligrams for three days. Uh, Cithromax, that is an antibiotic, one pill for three days. And uh, Ivermectin, which is 50 milligrams daily for five days. And in all the patients that follow the instructions, in five hours, 80% of the symptoms were better or gone. It, it was a hit. Unfortunately, they were saying in, in the news that ivermectin was used for animals only, which is not true. I, I've been using it with patients for decades, so I don't know why they were saying that. But the other thing is that... Uh, the patients felt so well, they, st- they would start doing things in the afternoon. And guess what happened? They would get sick again. And the next day, they would call me, your treatment didn't work. And I said, I know what you did. You didn't stay in bed like I told you to do for five days. You have to stay in bed. This is a, an indication that your body is weak. You need rest. And the ones that did the rest, they got well and, and never would recur again. But the other thing also that I saw that said to me, it's not something I I would recommend routinely, is that it did not prevent, and we knew this in 2020 from the Pfizer reports, for example, it will not prevent you from getting infected or giving it to someone else, the the COVID-19 virus. So I said, 
If it doesn't do that, what does it do? I want something that will keep me from dying and that will keep me from spreading it to other people. So that was uh, something that later the, the, the general narrative was admitting that that was the, the case, but I saw the information way before the public got the availability of that treatment. Mm. It's so interesting to hear you combine those vitamins with a very um, not a particularly expensive antibiotic and not a particularly expensive cortisone and ivermectin, which not only you've been using for many years, but also won a Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2015. Yes. So it's not like it was 1915. It was very fresh in people's memory. Yes. And I suppose we could spend quite a bit of time talking about the politics of that, but probably better to leave, let that go. But it, it's, it, it was a very interesting um, time. What was the lesson? And any lessons you learned from it or any observations you'd make from that? And yes, please I, feel I, free. I, yes, feel I forgot free. to mention that it didn't make sense. A lot of things do, did not make sense. It was a total disaster. Let's put it this way. It was a disaster from an academic point of view. You know, there's no study for any of these treatments from Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson. They don't exist. And they said to me, oh, my God, my, Marcial Vega has gone crazy now. No. After four months, they were so excited all over the world that they told the control group that got no vaccine. They said, listen, we gave you the placebo. Would you like to get it now? So at four months, most people got it. So from four months on, we don't have a study. We don't have a comparative, a comparison. And I need that information as a physician. I need people in the control group to be compared to people in the treated group, follow them for four or five years, to see the difference in side effects, in efficacy, in mortality, in infectious uh, spread, we don't, have, we don't have a study. It, it, nothing, zero. So, so that's a, another thing. And the fact that they put everybody in their home, that, that's absolute madness compared to what I was taught in medical school. I was taught that the sick people stayed at home. That's called quarantine. Not the healthy people, because if you put them healthy with the sick, what's going to happen? Everybody's going to get sick. No, that doesn't make any sense. You put the sick ones in another room, and the others can go out. It's not a big deal. It's actually healthier to do that, and it's healthier to go out in the, to the outside air. So this quarantine thing did not make any sense. It should not happen again. It was just uh, not good medicine, in my opinion. Hmm. But hopefully now that we know about all these things and, and the side effects because uh, there's a platform called VSAFE where a million people voluntarily reported the side effects they, they uh, had or didn't have. And in the VSAFE platform in the United States, 10% had side effects that require an emergency room visit or a doctor's office visit to take care of them. They were considered severe. So... We have to have all these things into, into consideration so it doesn't happen again. And we can discuss this even further because there's a lot of ramifications to, to everything that I said today. And I like to present the things with, with the evidence. The best evidence that I recommend people to do is to go to the Pfizer initial report to the FDA. That's available in the internet and read that. And they recommend they, they say the things that I've been saying here, plus they said... This treatment should not be forced into anybody because they're investigational. They said that. Each company said that. They should not be forced. It's investigational by federal law. So the narrative was not that. People were being forced. I mean, we, we have to... I, I don't mind recommending things, but informed consent is one of the most important things we have in medicine. So I wasn't telling the patients what to do. And I don't tell them what to do. I don't tell them, do it or don't do it. I said, I'll give you the information. I'll give you the information. I'll, I'll explain it to you. And then you decide what to do. That's, that's what I do with my patients. So then they can be informed and consenting because 99% of patients were not informed and they did not give informed consent, which is illegal, really. It's not proper medicine. It's unethical. It's immoral. And it's not professional. So... And I'm not blaming anyone. People were scared. So 
what we have to do is learn from this so we don't repeat it again. So we do it better the next time because, mind you, the highest mortality in the world or one of the highest, if not the highest mortality, was in the United States where most people got the treatment. In Africa, where only uh, around 11% of the people got the treatment, Africa has the lowest mortality in the world of COVID-19. So we have to start thinking a little bit more about all these things and what would be the best thing to do. Wow, Victor. Uh, listen, I want us just to finish up with one thing now. I, I'm going to take a step back from your role as a health practitioner, as a professor of medicine, uh, because we are all individuals on a health journey in this modern world. Uh, what do you think the biggest challenge is? What do you think the biggest challenge is for people as individuals on that health journey in this modern world? The biggest challenge is the ignorance that we're surrounded by, unfortunately. And I can't, I'm guilty of ignorance. I mean, don't think that I'm not. I, I am. I would like to be not ignorant in the future and be able to recognize when I'm ignorant. Those are the challenges. Because at one point in life, I was, I was another person, very ignorant about opening my mind. So ignorance comes from not having a completely open mind, which to me is the main requirement, not just for physicians, especially for physicians, but for any healthcare practitioner and for any human being. Because if we don't have an open mind to discuss our differences, we'll never reach a consensus. Because everybody has a different opinion. That's the beauty of the world. If we were all the same, it would be boring. So we have to be able to sit down at the same table and be able to discuss everything. And number two, one of the biggest challenges is getting the curriculum in medical schools to include all of this. I don't see it happening right now, unfortunately. So... I'm using platforms like the one you so graciously offered tonight to be able to share that information with lay people and physicians. I have a channel for healthcare practitioners only where I show them how to do the things I do. And they're welcome to contact me, medical doctors, dentists, medical students, and other healthcare practitioners to be able to learn this from a medical point of view, how to use it as a medical tool. And that's, that's my goal, because it will spread all over the place. And it's already spreading, thank God. But uh, that's the biggest challenge, the medical schools, my gosh. Victor, thank you so much for joining me today. I've been so looking forward to this conversation, and you haven't disappointed me. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us, and we will have links to those challenges in our show notes. Thank you, Ron. It's been a pleasure. So take care, my good friend. And uh Take care, all of you, and uh, I'm here at your service and everybody's so welcome. Well, what a story and so much in that episode that was just gems. There were so many gems there and so much food for thought, and I love the focus on electrons and the fact that we are walking electricity. Our body is functioning not on 240 volts or 120 volts as they do in America, uh, but on 70 microvolts. That's 70 one thousandths of a volt. And that is really critically important. And it's obvious, often surprises me when I hear public health authorities demonize the sun, which gives us life and has done since the beginning of time, and say, oh, you must avoid it at all costs. But these devices that we carry around with us and have in our, on our bodies, in our pockets, by our heads, in our laps, by our beds, in front of us right now, apparently no problem at all. Well, I don't buy it. And as Victor pointed out, there are so many environmental triggers to poor health. And when he actually quantifies the electric, the electric uh, effect of 70 microvolts is how we function normally. And when that charge goes down, we have, well, cancer is one extreme. When it goes down below 30 or 40 microvolts, then a cell becomes cancerous. So our relationship with energy, with the energy from the sun, with the blue light with which we uh, bathe ourselves in through LED lights, 
computer screens and our mobile devices is perhaps our biggest challenge, how we control those. And I know that I spend most of my time at the computer wearing these kind of glasses which fit over my um, my existing glasses and when I'm watching TV, if I have another pair of glasses at the in the uh, in the TV room where I have that. So this is not something just, oh, well, isn't that interesting? And then you forget it and move on because this is something that is critically important to health. I also love asking um, my guests, what do you think the biggest challenge is for us as individuals? And it's so interesting that Victor chose ignorance as being the biggest challenge because I truly believe if someone someone asked that to me recently and I was a guest on their podcast and, I, and uh, I said, well, I often ask that of my guests so you can ask that of me. Well, my answer to that question was like Victor, completely unprompted, just with great synchronicity, ignorance. And I mean that. Ignorance, look, is something that I practice regularly. I practice ignorance regularly. It's actually why I have this podcast. Every week I get to ask people that know much more than me uh, on subjects and guess what? They answer them and I learn a lot and I hope you do too. But when ignorance is combined with ego, arrogance and hubris, as many medical practitioners, in fact, many people, um, not just medical practitioners, but many people uh, approach their ignorance in that way. And if, worst of all, it informs public health policy, then, if the evidence is anything to go by, we have an epidemic in preventable chronic degenerative diseases. And on top of ignorance, I would add overwhelm because, well, we are all overwhelmed. We are overwhelmed with an abundance of distractions and news and media and social media and streaming services, et cetera, et cetera. But if you think you are overwhelmed, well, just put yourself in the shoes of medical practitioners who not only have a waiting room full of patients that are overwhelming them, but are also bombarded by an avalanche of medical research. So when a doctor says there is no research to support X, Y, or Z, it implies that they have read all the research. And I happen to know that to keep up with all the research, it takes about 600 hours of continuous reading every week. And let's face it, we just don't have the time. So it's much more humbling and I think empowering to say, I don't know, but I might find out. And I find that uh, really empowering. The more I learn about health, in fact, about life, the more I realize I don't know, and I find that exciting. And I've been in healthcare for 45 years, so I feel I have an awful lot still to learn. And I find that exciting. I hope you do too. Listen, I would encourage you to join our unstressed health community. This is where like-minded practitioners, and I am building an advisory panel as we speak, uh, and there will be lots of, uh, of great resources that are independent of industry and have only one thing as their goal, and that is to improve the health of an individual and also to improve the health of the workplace, which is a major focus for unstressed health as well. I hope this finds you well. We'll have links to Victor's sites where he provides some great resources to follow up on some of the issues that he's raised here today. I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.